Welcome back to the IBD School Basics series. This episode, IBD School 110, introduces a lot of medical terms used in discussing IBD, which will be very important for understanding your disease and in getting you ready for the IBD School Advanced series of videos. I would like to introduce my colleague, Ryan Stidham, one of our specialists in Crohn's and colitis, who has developed new methods for using ultrasound to measure bowel damage in Crohn's disease. In this video, we'll help you understand important medical terms in IBD, beginning with locations in the digestive system, then talking about some other important medical words you'll be hearing. When I talk to my doctor or look on a website about IBD, they use big words like ileitis or duodenum. How can I know what they're talking about when they're speaking in a foreign language? We'll start with an overview of anatomy of the digestive tract. Basically, it's a continuous long tube that runs from the mouth to the anus. Different sections of the tract have unique functions. Let's look again at this process in more detail. We'll start at the beginning with food moving from the mouth through the esophagus and into the stomach. When you swallow food, it passes through the mouth to the pharynx and then enters the esophagus. The esophagus is a thick muscular tube in the chest that pushes food down into the stomach. Crohn's disease can affect the entire GI tract from mouth to the colon. The stomach's job is to begin digestion of the food. In the upper part of the stomach, food is mixed with a lot of fluid, acid, and protein digesting enzymes. The stomach has its own muscles, which allow it to grind the food into a more liquid consistency. The stomach can hold up to two to three liters of fluid. The stomach is connected to the small intestine by the pylorus, a muscular valve, or a gate. The intestine only handles a small amount of food and liquid at a time. The pylorus slowly opens and closes to make sure just the right amount of contents move into the small intestine. If the pylorus is scarred by Crohn's disease, it can prevent food from passing to the intestine. This can lead to nausea and vomiting after eating. Severe narrowing can sometimes be opened using a balloon through an endoscope and sometimes requires surgery. Now we're inside the small intestine. This is where we absorb most of the nutrients in our food. Although it's more than three times as long as the large intestine, it's called the small intestine because it's only about one and a half to two inches around. That's about all most people would need to know about the small intestine. But people with IBD will hear specific terms used to refer to three parts of the small intestine. The first part is called the duodenum. The duodenum is short. It's only about 10 inches long and shaped a bit like a horseshoe. It's here that fluids from your gallbladder and pancreas are added to the food to break down proteins and fat and neutralize the acid in the food from your stomach. The second part of the small intestine is roughly six feet long. It's called the jejunum. It's here where the majority of nutrients are absorbed into the body. The last and longest part of the small intestine is the ileum. It's about 13 feet long. Here in the ileum, the body absorbs vitamin B12 and most of your bile acids. These bile acids are sent back to the liver and gallbladder to be recycled for another round of fat digestion. If part of the ileum is damaged or removed surgically, it can affect the absorption of B12 and bile acids. B12 blood levels can help your doctor decide whether you need extra B12. If you have a short segment, less than 100 centimeters, of remaining ileum, bile acids can be poorly absorbed and pass through to the colon. This irritates the colon and can cause watery diarrhea, called bile acid diarrhea. Additionally, you can run out of bile acids because they are not being recycled. When this occurs, you can develop fat malabsorption and diarrhea, called steatorrhea, for fatty diarrhea, that floats in the toilet. Both of these kinds of diarrhea are treatable, but not with the usual anti-inflammatory medications used for IBD. At the very end of the ileum is the terminal ileum, or TI. 
The TI is lined with lots of immune cells in groups called follicles. These immune cells sample the food and bacteria passing through the TI, acting as an immune surveillance system. The TI is the most common place for Crohn's disease to occur. The TI comes just before the ileocecal valve, or IC valve, which is a small muscular valve between the small and large intestine. Its job is to control and slow down food passing into the large intestine for further processing. The IC valve also keeps fecal matter and bacteria in the colon from backwashing up into the small intestine, where it could otherwise enter and contaminate the bloodstream. In summary, the small intestine is comprised of the duodenum, then the jejunum, then the ileum. The terminal ileum is at the very end of the small intestine, and the IC valve controls the flow of food into the colon and prevents stool and bacteria from flowing backwards into the small intestine. Let's look at some terms related to problems in the small intestine. As you likely know, we use itis. It means inflammation. You're familiar with the term appendicitis, inflammation of the appendix. When the first part of the small intestine is inflamed, we call it duodenitis, inflammation of the duodenum. You can also have jejunitis or ileitis. When surgery is done on the small intestine, a portion of the surface area for absorbing food is taken out. Removing small segments is not a problem, but removing larger segments or repeated surgeries can cause nutritional problems. Now let's move on to the large intestine or the colon. Within the colon, the leftovers from the small intestine are mixed with mucus and bacteria that live in a large intestine. As this mixture travels through the colon, the lining of the colon absorbs most of the water and some vitamins and minerals. The bacteria in the colon digest fiber and remaining nutrients to produce short-chain fatty acids, or SCFAs. The cells lining the colon use the SCFAs for nourishment. If there is no food passing through the colon for several months, the lack of short-chain fatty acids can lead to a form of inflammation called diversion colitis. The first part of the colon is called the cecum. It's a pouch that receives contents from the small intestines, absorbs fluids and salts, and adds mucus. This is where the appendix is located. The next three sections of the colon are shaped like an upside-down U. The ascending colon, or right colon, starts at the bottom right-hand side of the abdomen and ascends, or goes upwards, towards the liver. Then comes the transverse colon. Transverse means across. This part of the colon goes across the abdomen from right to left. It is where stool normally starts to become solid. Then the descending colon, or left colon, descends or goes downwards on the left-hand side of the abdomen. Any kind of inflammation of the colon is called colitis. Removal of the colon does not affect nutrient absorption. But without the colon to absorb water, bowel movements are more watery and more frequent. From the descending colon, the colon makes an S-curve as it connects to the rectum. Another word for S-curve is sigmoid. And so this part of the colon is called the sigmoid colon. The final piece of the digestive system is the rectum. The rectum is able to stretch and hold a lot of stool. The anus and the anal sphincter muscles hold stool in until you're ready to have a bowel movement. If this area is inflamed, it is called proctitis. When you have active proctitis, the rectum is not able to stretch and store stool very well. As a result, you may feel the urge to make bowel movements more frequently or have frequent small bowel movements. In review, the colon begins as a pouch named the cecum. The next three parts of the colon are simply named for the direction food wastes move. The right colon or ascending colon, the transverse colon, and then the left or descending colon. Then comes the S-shaped portion called the sigmoid. And finally, the rectum where stool is stored until it is passed through the anal canal.
Now that you know the GI tract, let's talk about the words we use to describe the different ways we have for looking inside the GI tract. I'll start with terms that have an ending based on scope, meaning an instrument we use for viewing. We use a microscope to look at tiny or micro things. Endo means within, so endoscopy is a general term used any time we use a scope to look inside the body. Colonoscopy is the term for looking at the entire colon through the anus. Often we can go across the IC valve and into the terminal ilium for four to eight inches as well. Sigmoidoscopy is a procedure similar to colonoscopy but does not go as far. Only the sigmoid colon and descending colon is where this procedure goes to. When we put a scope through the mouth and look at the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum, we call it esophago-gastro-duodenoscopy. That's a long word, so we usually just call it an EGD. Here's an easier term. When we look at the ileum, it's called ileoscopy. Enteroscopy looks at deeper parts of the small intestine. Balloon enteroscopy is a method that uses a special endoscope with a balloon to reach deeper sections of the small intestine. Capsule endoscopy is a method that uses a swallowable camera to take pictures of the small intestine. Some people call it a pill cam. Before using a capsule or a pill cam in Crohn's disease, we usually have the patient swallow a patency capsule. It's a test pill about the same size as the actual camera that ensures it will easily pass through the intestine without getting stuck. If the patency capsule does get stuck, which happens about 5% of the time in patients with Crohn's disease, it simply dissolves. This is preferable to having the actual camera get stuck and have to have it removed surgically. After any of these examinations, your doctor will tell you what was revealed. He may use terms you're familiar with or those you just don't understand. Inflammation. This means there is active immune response causing symptoms and swelling. An ulcer means that there is a crater in the lining of the intestine, which is usually caused by inflammation, leaving damage that takes a while to heal. Fibrosis. This means an abnormal amount of scarring, often resulting from repeated cycles of inflammation and then healing. Stricture or stenosis. These terms refer to a narrowed segment of the intestine, which can be caused by inflammation or scarring. If food has had a hard time getting through the upstream segment of intestine, it often becomes dilated or stretched out from the pressure. Fistula. This is an abnormal opening from one area into another. These usually occur in or near a stricture due to high pressure and an intestinal wall that is weakened by inflammation. Fistulas let food or stool pass around a stricture to low pressure spaces. Fistulas can connect to the skin, to nearby segments of intestine, or to other organs that are also nearby. Abscess. This is when infectious material is walled off by the body to keep it from spreading. This often occurs next to a stricture or at the end of a fistula. It usually is full of pus and needs to be drained or surgically removed. Whatever terms your doctor uses, whether describing locations in your body, recommended procedures, or results, be sure you understand what is being said. Ask questions. The better you understand your doctor, the more you'll understand your IBD.